thank you to all of you. We have a huge crowd tonight. Um, this event sold out in a record-breaking 88 seconds. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, we probably could have filled this room a few times over. Um, and so if we ever needed proof that Toronto is a city of readers that have damn good taste, then this is it. And I'm so excited that you're all here tonight. I also want to thank TD Bank Group, who's here tonight, and for their support last month with Black History Month and for tonight's program. And finally, I'm going to turn things over uh, to a far more capable host than myself. Uh, she, is, uh, she has spent 10 years with the CBC, and she got her start in the world of film with Channel Zero, telling stories of social unrest around the world. Uh, she has served as host of Canada Live, Radio 2's Top 20, Backstage Pass, Big City, Small World, and you can currently catch her on Jazz FM's Good Morning Toronto. Please help me welcome Miss Garvia Bailey. <laughs> Look at you all. Bunch of quick, smarty pantses, all of you. Well done, well done. Uh, in preparing to interview our guest today, I was racking my brain to come up with situations in culture when a literary voice or a figure or an individual with political moxie and a feminist bent goes from a name you're kind of familiar with to a widespread cultural obsession. And it was really hard. It happens all the time in the world of pop culture, but in the literary world, it's somewhat more remarkable. Roxanne Gay's name to those who have had their eyes peeled for the standout, unique, unafraid voices in feminist literature and beyond. Well, she isn't new to you, because you're a bunch of smarty pants, as I mentioned. Uh, her award-winning book, Untamed State, came out in 2014, followed quickly by a collection called Bad Feminists in August of 2014, a series of funny, sharp, immensely readable conversations. Her essays, her thoughts, and insights appear everywhere. I've been obsessing. Um, her Twitter account put her squarely in our cultural high beams. Girl, you and Twitter. We need to talk about Twitter. We can. We're going to talk about Twitter. Um, Time Magazine declared 2014 the year of Roxane Gay. And that year, it's true. That year has lasted three years, which is why we're here. Uh, she's the first woman to lead a Marvel comic. Her latest collection is Difficult Women. Can I stop now? Is it in the se sixth print or seventh? Eighth. <laughs> I mean, if, if we're counting. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. Her name's on everyone's lips. She found salvation through reading and writing, and for many of us, we found a glimmer of salvation through her words, Roxane Gay. <laughs> I wish there was something for us to talk about. Yeah, I guess you know, we should just go home. I don't know. It was, it was nice to see all of you. Spend the time. Um, so these people in front of you practically got out steely knives to be here against one another, <laughs> but they made it. Oh, um, I thought there might have been some love connections in the line. I, was there? Did anyone find love in the lineup? We'll find out next year. We will. <laughs> Just so long as I'm invited to the wedding. Lots of babies named Roxanne. Oh, God. Oh, that's going to be nice. <laughs> that's the dream. Uh, <laughs> So this event sell, sold out in record time, as was mentioned. And, I, and I, I expect that you see that as a mark of success. But I want sure. to know on a personal level, with all of this that's going on, this is happening all around Canada, the US. What does success look like to you, though? Oh, success is my dad being able to go to bookstores and rearrange them <laughs> uh, <laughs> to highlight my books better. <laughs> <laughs> he is a one-man Haitian army. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I, when I was thinking like how my parents would react when they realized that I had books in the world, I thought they'd just be like, eh, whatever. Happy, but like indifferent. Turns out my dad is a super fan. And <laughs> that to me is success, that he gets to enjoy this, that my parents get to enjoy this, and like see me on TV and um, make Oh, make booksellers' lives hell. They just. I love it. He goes into Barnes and Noble, and <laughs> if that shit is not on the front table, 
get your life right. <laughs> <laughs> because he will get it right for you. <laughs> it is what it is. That's, that's success. It is. That's success. Uh, did I read somewhere that at four years old, when I was picking my nose and eating it probably. Delicious. And eating dirt, <laughs> likely. As one does. But you were writing at yeah. four. Ish. Yes, I was. I would draw villages on napkins and then write stories about the people in the villages and like what their lives were like. And so my parents saw that and they were like, what? why are you writing on a napkin like a little hobo? <laughs> <laughs> and so they got me my first typewriter. And so I was, I know, they're, <laughs> they're super cute. And so then I would just like type out little stories. And I mean, they were like five words, but still, <laughs> they were good. <laughs> so you had a good sense of self at four years old, is what you're saying. Yes. I did at four. Yeah. I did. I think, almost, yes, I lost it a few years later. But at four, I was just like, you can't tell me shit. Right. <laughs> So fast forwarding to beyond five words mm -hmm. or beyond five letters, what was the first piece of writing where you were like, yeah, that's the thing that I'm going to be doing like a, a mad woman? You know, I, it honestly did start with the little stories. Really? I just knew I loved doing it and I just never wanted to stop. And so I kept doing it and doing it and then I wrote more different, you know, like I, the stories became more sophisticated. And then in high school, my teacher, Mr. McGuinn, noticed my writing for a couple of reasons. One, I was writing some batshit crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he noticed that there was form and there was craft at play. And he encouraged me to write. And that's when I knew even more powerfully that this is what I want to do. And you've been just doing it. I have. A lot of it. Doing it and doing it and doing and it well. And doing it well. <laughs> <laughs> LL Cool J has taken a left turn, but his music holds up even if he doesn't. It really does. <laughs> it really does. And who says he doesn't hold up? Like as He's a physical crazy. Being? Well, he might be crazy, but. I mean, oh no, he holds up, but <laughs> not mentally. <laughs> Which matters. The, the package is nice, though. I mean, he's right. clearly hitting the gym a lot. Because sometimes you could just, like... I, oh, if I could just tape his mouth tape shut. Tape it! Yeah, just, like, <laughs> Men are to be seen and fucked, but not heard. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Words to live by. Write those down. <laughs> So if you're tweeting, now would be a good time to just quote that. My dad follows me on Twitter. <laughs> it's going to be great. Oh, my goodness. Um, so let's, let's talk about this book of yours, yes. this, this latest. Diffi well, the, you've got oh, right. five million of them. Let's talk about no, difficult three. women, though. Yes. Let's yeah. talk. I'd like to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was written before Bad Feminist. Yes which I found very interesting. I didn't know that until just recently. Mm -hmm. 21 stories in this collection, difficult women. Um, and what jumped out at me was the essay on being likable. Mm -hmm. As I read Difficult Women, that essay from Bad Feminist kept on reverberating in my brain for whatever reason, this idea of likability. And I'm, I'm wondering if that was something that was reverberating in your, your own sense of self as you wrote these, these, these incredible characters. No, it wasn't. I think that essay came after. It did? Yes, because I was looking at the women in these stories, and many of them would be considered unlikable according to a lot of the societal rules that we have for women and how we should behave. And so um, I, I thought a lot about likability in the aftermath because uh, this book was the very first book I ever tried to sell, and it's the book I got my first agent with. And when it was being shopped around, editors at the time said, oh, these stories are really good, but they're too dark. And it's just, I just want to die after reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent gave me this news, and I was like, yes, that's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> um, so <laughs> mission accomplished. And... Um, so that frustrated me because I thought about, for example, Dennis Lehane, 
who writes fiction, and his fiction is incredibly dark. And nobody ever tells Dennis Lehane, A, you're, look, you're making Boston look bad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or that your writing is too dark. People are just like, oh, give me more. Let's make 500 movies out of your books. And so, you know, the double standard really got under my skin, and so I wrote that essay. Right. Um, it, but it isn't, like you said, it's dark. There, it, it's not easy. It's not easy reading. It's not something that you sit down and, you, and, for me anyway, that I could just go through the whole thing in one sitting, which is what I would usually do with a book of short stories, especially. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, but these are women that have lived through ima unimaginable abuse, some of them, um, women who are haunted. They fight one another in some cases uh, for a form of release. But they're funny, and they're sexy, and they're smart, many of them. They make bad choices. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> but in this visceral writing of these women, I'm wondering um, about the space that you had to occupy to go to some of those dark corners. You know, I get asked that a lot, and it wasn't, I don't know that I went to a troubling space, which I think probably says that I'm troubled. <laughs> troubled. <laughs> but exactly. Did I say that? <laughs> yes, you did. Um, you know, it's fiction, and I, I have a very vivid imagination, and so it was just a lot of fun to be able to write this story, to write these stories, and, and not fun in that I took pleasure in the darkness, but um, it just uh, thinking about the, the lives of women and the directions that those lives can take was really satisfying, and so it was challenging to write some of these stories, and there are always moments when you have to take a breath as a writer and just whew, step away from the page, but all of these stories were very creatively satisfying. What was one of those deep breathing type moments? Um, I think the story that I found the most challenging was Strange Gods, mm -hmm. and because it was really a, it's a love story, yeah. and it's a love story tied up in sort of a woman trying to explain to her lover why she is the way she is. And, you know, that was just a difficult story to write and to look at this woman and the bad decisions that she has made over time and, you know, just wanting to rescue her from herself, but that wasn't what the story demanded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when they came to you, these women, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering about the, the, the woman that came to you first in this whole series? Because this wasn't written as a collection. No, it was not. So who, who came first, and then how did, you don't have to explain how every single one of them tumbled out, but I, I'm wondering about who, who got the, the ball rolling. Oh uh, yeah, this collection, the very first story in this collection was Bone Density, Yeah. Uh, which is just a story about a marriage. And that was, you know, I think I was the youngest when I wrote that, so I was still very much in the sad marriage vein of fiction mm -hmm. uh, that I, I, I strongly encourage writers to avoid. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about infidelity and how in this couple they were both being, um, they were both cheating. Yeah. And that was the real turn on to me, like that they're both horrible. And mm -hmm. th not that cheating is horrible, um, but that they were just both flawed. Right. and they still stayed together. And that was interesting to me. And so she was the first that came to me. And as, as these rolled out, I, you, you talk about love, love stories in this way, sort of the twist mm -hmm. on love stories. And I was, as I read these, I thought about you as, because I've been watching you so much on Twitter, mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've heard you so, so, like, I mean, following you kind of voraciously and Stalker. I, totally. <laughs> I know. I'm the worst kind of stalker because I just told you. You did. I'm, I'm not good at it. Right I'm now. not good at it. <laughs> so I, I just, I'm, as we, I was wondering about you as the romantic because that is something that I don't think that I've heard many people talk to you about because you seem, you're like, to me, just a romantic I am. little flower. I am. Totally. Thank you. So oh my God. Romance. I feel seen for the first time. <laughs> you know, it's true. And I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up because people always tell me, oh, your writing is so dark. And I'm like, all of the stories are hopeful. And yeah. there are actually some very nice stories in the book that have nothing to do with darkness at all. And, and I have a deep romantic streak. Um, 
I, it's very bad. Is it? Well, it's very good for one person. <laughs> and, are you a wooer or a, a wooee? Oh, um, or you I, would rather be both? I think I'm both, yeah. but yeah, I woo all day long, year after year. <laughs> Oh, do yeah. you woo woo woo? I, I do. <laughs> I woo woo woo. <laughs> High five. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know. I can tell. You read it, and that's what you I get. Love, but I love. It's just. I find romance to be joyful, and I mean, when you have the right person to be joyful with, it's just like a thrill. Like, what can I do? Like, let's get a hot air balloon and fly over Los Angeles and. I don't know, drink champagne. Of course. It's absurd, but it's also fun. Yeah. And so I do enjoy it. And I also enjoy romance in my fiction, like all of my love stories. Um, there are trials and tribulations, but the girl always gets the guy or the girl, or the guy gets the guy or the girl. And um, I guess not always, but that for me is fun. And I love to go there. And I think we don't see enough romance. So many people are like, oh, love is so much work and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, then find somebody better to love. Absolutely. Like, you know, it can be fun as well. I mean, it is work. Certainly other people are other people. But uh, I do tend, when I'm writing about love, to focus on just romance very mm -hmm. much so. But not traditional romance like, you know, Walgreens uh, right. romance. But right. More um, greeting card greeting romance. Card. Yeah. By the way, one yes. of the most controversial things I've ever tweeted was criticizing straight men at Walgreens the night before Valentine's Day, <laughs> which I did on February 13th of this year. And you would have thought that I had, I don't know, declared fatwa. It was just <laughs> the response. Men were just like, how did you know they were heterosexual? <laughs> And I was like, wow. well, I live in rural Indiana, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that this is a fucking leap. Um, anyway, I just get so disgusted because Valentine's Day is the exact same day every year. Yeah, and they're and so rushing. They were, exactly. And so I went to Walgreens after work to pick something up, not a card, because I had handled my business. <laughs> Well before my Valentine's Day gift had already been received and opened. All right. And I saw all these men just looking in the aisle, just like looking sad and then like grabbing those shitty red hearts. Oh. And I was just like, this is the best you can do for the woman who does your laundry? Motherfucker, what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Romance. Sorry. Romance. Sorry, but. Romance. But yes. 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 Do better. Go to, I mean, go to Walgreens on the 12th. Yeah. At least, at, at the least. very least. This road is heading towards Twitter big time. Oh, it is. Is it All ever? roads lead All to Twitter. All roads lead to Twitter. This is what I found. Um, on top of the romance, though, there are some relationships. I, I joked about, you know, there's majority women here. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I talked about stealing knives, and, and then I felt a little bit bad because no one did that. Because Yeah, they did. Some of them did, probably. Um, but the relationships between women and the bonds that occur uh, in difficult women was something that resonated in such a profound way for me anyway, because so much of what we get in the pop culture world is, you know, sorry, I'm going to say it, Vanderpump Rules and Shh, yeah, sorry. And, <laughs> and Big Brother. She loves that show. Is what I've learned. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Whoever Thank you, that you one person. You're amazing. I see you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's about women and, you know, the real housewives of so and so. We, we're a culture that's really about pitting women against one Absolutely. another. Absolutely. And it's atrocious. It suggests that the nature of women's relationships is always going to be catty or bitchy or dangerous. And I wrote an essay about this. Um, it, it, I'm fascinated. And oftentimes I get emails. And a lot of times people are looking for advice or counsel or they're looking for me to affirm their worldview. Yeah. And a, a significant number of these emails are, I just have trouble getting along with other women. And I just always think, perhaps you might be the problem here. <laughs> Like, is it really women or is it you? But I, I think that we have to work against this narrative. And I think that when women are competitive in these toxic ways, it's because 
we have been enculturated in a culture that demands that we are competitive with one another and demands that we live up to very rigid ideals for how we comport ourselves and what we look like. And, and so, of course, we're competing. We're competing for morsels and scraps mm -hmm. from the table of the patriarchy. And um, those scraps are all we have to survive on. So, of course, there's going to be some competition and some negative and toxic relationships. But I don't think that's the norm. I think that most women fight against that, don't even have to fight against that. We work together because we know that eventually we will overcome. Right. And so it's important for me to write healthy relationships between women that are complex. And so it doesn't mean that everything's OK all the time. But they, they, they are nuanced in the ways that we are nuanced and have complex relationships in our own lives. Mm. Yes, yes. In thinking about that, though, we, ha we, we are at this weird time in mm -hmm. feminism mm -hmm. where those steely knives are real. Like, I mean, I, I struggled with this I, when I, I was asked to do this event. I was like, okay, but Roxanne Gay, she's like so, she's so learned and theoretical, and I'm just like one of those feminists that are like, yeah, feminism, yeah, like, you know. And then we're not going to see eye to eye, and I got rid of that real quick. You I'm know? glad because I would have rid I, you of it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have no doubt. I have no <laughs> doubt that would have happened. <clears throat> but that is what we're dealing with. Like every day, I feel like we're all we're looking at a woman coming after a, a woman because of her brand of feminism. Mm -hmm. It's oh man, there's been a couple books that have been released in the past year that have basically been women critiquing feminism, and I just think, what have you done? And I got this from my friend Amina. On, t uh, on Twitter, what have you done for feminism lately? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think that critiquing feminism is absolutely important, but that can't be the whole of feminist scholarship. We have to be able to just practice feminism, um, whatever that feminism looks like. It, it, it's really frustrating that year after year, decade after decade, we're still having the same tired conversations about feminism uh, and so much of the work is not happening because we're embroiled in these conversations. And, you know, like right now, everyone is like, oh, corporate feminism is terrible. And, oh, don't wear those hats and don't get a, a, a mug that says feminist. I mean, fuck, who cares? Do whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's dismissive to suggest that just because you might have a, a mug, for example, that says feminist on it, that that's the end of your feminist journey. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's a mug. Like, <laughs> It's a, a, a device with which we drink coffee and tea. <laughs> uh, perhaps that's all it is. And, and I think we see the ways in which women are diminished and treated as if we are incapable of thought. Yeah. Uh, and it, this, when this comes from other women, it's disheartening. It's very disheartening. And it's disheartening because stakes is high right now. They are. They are. And we should, I mean, I never want to tell someone that, you, that, that their scholarship is not important or that they should be doing something better, but some of us should be doing something better. Um, and so they, there's so much to be fighting for right now, uh, just in terms of thinking about reproductive freedom, at least in the context of the United States, but frankly everywhere, mm -hmm. especially now that Trump and his administration have put the global gag order um, on nonprofits um, with regards to abortion. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some very real battles that need to be fought, and I think that we will fight them better um, by just focusing on that instead right. of worrying about various flavors of feminism. And who read what? Yes. And, and I'm like, I told you in Bad Feminist, I haven't read shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take me at my word and keep it moving. Um, I, I want to congratulate you on uh, Wakanda. Oh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so tapped by that uh, Marvel Universe by your friend, Talia Nassi Coates. Yes. What a, what, a, what a fella. Yes, he's a fine, fine he's, fella. He's done all right for himself. I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> your novels, um, doing so well. Prime to come down the pipe is Hunger. Yes. Right? Um, a film coming yes. your way for Untamed States. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, there's some more uh, nonfiction around television. Oh, geez, how do you even know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I do my research. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you what. <laughs> My agent hasn't even seen the proposal for that book. <laughs> Damn. Do you need a new agent? No. Oh, okay. no. All right. Just, oh, just no. put it out there. I'm just thrilled. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about short stories, though. Oh, because always. Because this is, to me, like, I, I read everything that you do, but short, something about your short stories. I have stories. three or four books worth of short stories sitting on my hard drive. Right. Yeah, I've written a lot, so um, I have to, like, <laughs> look at them and make sure they're good. Uh, a lot of it's my younger writing, and I, ha I still haven't done anything with my master's thesis, which was a short story collection. I've got lots of, I got game. You got stuff. Yeah, I do. What does short story writing do for you that, that, this, that so many of these other um, genres that you write in cannot touch? Hmm. Well, I, I was a short story writer first. It's where I started. And so nothing else will ever compare because it's my first love as a writer. And there's something very satisfying about writing a short story and trying to tell a story that's satisfying and grand within the constraint of 4,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 words. That's very seductive to me. And it's something, a challenge that I will always enjoy trying to meet. And so I'll always write short stories. That's why you're sharpening, sharpening that stick with Twitter. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 140 characters, that's what you get. Yes, you gotta be concise. It's a short story every time. It is. Hmm. We'll talk about Twitter. <laughs> Not yet, though. I know, you keep teasing them. <laughs> I know. They might come and get you. I'll just be like. <laughs> um, I think that the, you've done something that a lot of uh, bl black writers, especially of this generation, have been struggling to do forever, and that's catch the ears and the minds of sort of a general populace mm -hmm. beyond just you know the literature nerds that we all are in this room right now. Um, and I see people hanging on your words, seeking out your thoughts on everything. And I'm wondering about, have you thought about why it is that you have hit something in the, the people that are beyond the people in this room um, that has you know, CNN calling you for, the, for your opinion? Or you know, what is it? Mm. You know, that's a good question. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. I really am, because I don't know. I think that part of it is that I'm honest in my work. Yeah. And I say things that a lot of people feel but don't say or are unwilling to admit. I suppose that I'm willing to admit my, f my weaknesses and uh, the gaps in my knowledge. And I'm willing to acknowledge other points of view while making clear that they're wrong. Um, <laughs> and so I think that I allow a space for people to engage in criticism of popular culture and in thinking about um, the sociopolitical climate in ways that don't make them feel attacked right. when they disagree. And I think that's important. I, I think that polemical work is important as well, and there's a time and place for it. I, but I, I, I'm a Libra, and so <laughs> I'm always just looking for balance and looking for multiple sides to an issue. And I think that people appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I also think I use humor well. Yeah. And uh, I consider it to be the spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. And there's a lot of medicine these days. There's a ton of medicine. And so I'm always just thinking, how do I get people to care about some of the very real things that we're dealing with? And of course, there are times when I don't use humor. Um, when I wrote, for example, about the Charleston massacre, uh, there was no place for humor in writing about what Dylan Roof did. And, um, but I am also willing to go there and think through these sort of complex issues. And many people are, but I think I just, uh, my voice comes through clearly and people just for whatever reason are gravitating toward that. They're not only gravitating towards it, but um, there is, I mean, the boss move around the publishing of your next book. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
I mean, you want to talk about the universe slapping someone down, this, that, that young, that man. Mm. I'm telling you, that happened swiftly. I it was did. like, I was like, thank you, goddess. That was quick and serious. Um, so for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, uh, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. I just said the name, y'all. I didn't, I didn't give birth to him. Um, you made that move to, to pull it. And I think that um, a lot of, uh, it, you know what? I'm going to say that a lot of thought went into that decision, but I have a feeling a lot of thought didn't go into it. You just. Not really. You, yeah. Yeah. I, when I woke up the day that the news broke that Milo had um, sold the book to Simon and she was, Simon and Schuster for $250,000. I was like, oh, who bought that book? And I saw that it was Simon and Schuster. And I was like, whew, thank God, it's not my publisher. Uh, because I do my fiction at Grove Atlantic and I do the majority of my nonfiction at HarperCollins. And so I was like, I'm in the clear. A couple weeks later, I got an email from my editor saying, hey, are you still on track to deliver your book at the end of the month? And I was like, oh, God damn it, I'm doing a TED book. I forgot. And TED is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And after all that shit talking I did, I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so the night before I was supposed to turn the book in, it was also not quite ready. But <laughs> <laughs> that's neither here nor there. The truth. <laughs> I was really thinking. Could I be at a publisher with, like, it's one thing to publish a book, but a quarter of a million dollars, which is more than the advance for my first six books. I have three books published, just so you know. Like, that's my market rate even now, um, publishing. Um, it, it's, I just was like, this is terrible. And what really bothers me about Milo is that he's not a true believer. He's a provocateur. Yeah. And his followers are true believers, and his followers are dangerous. If he was a true believer, I probably would not have, I would have minded, but not as much. Because at least he has, you know, a conviction about him. But he just likes to make trouble. And he's using race and sexuality as the fulcrum for the trouble. And that's really horrible. And so I thought about it. And in the morning, I emailed my agent. And I said, you know what? I'm not turning my manuscript in tomorrow. I'm pulling the book. And she said, OK. She was on board. She did not try to talk me out of it. It was just wonderful. Uh, her name is Maria Massey, and she's killer. Um, and once I decided, I was at peace. And I did not give it a second thought. I never doubted myself. Some of the backlash was frustrating, yeah. because yeah. I wasn't trying to squelch free speech. Free speech doesn't mean you get a quarter of a million dollars. That's not how it works. Free speech means, dude, you can say what you want. And he continues, he can say what he wants. He can find another publisher. Um, but you know, Simon & Schuster doubled down. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they moved the release date of his book to the same day as Hunger. And I was like, OK, bring it. <laughs> because there's nobody in the world that's going to buy Hunger that's also <laughs> going to buy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not taking anything away from me. But I, it was a petty move. And that actually made me feel even better about my decision. And I also knew I could afford to do it. Uh, the reason I, I think I've been able to make some of the choices I have in my career is that I have a day job. And that is the most freeing thing in the world for a writer to have. Because nobody owns me but Purdue. Yeah. <laughs> I can do what I want because I have a fallback. I know how to live on a f English professor's salary. I've done it for years, and it's fine, especially in Indiana. I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, so it was just I made the right decision. But that kind of move, I mean, we talked about just now the, the reach that you have and the influence that you have. And I wonder when you, when you make a stand like that, I wonder if you, you're as you move through this world and your name gets bigger and bigger, as a black woman, I feel like sometimes that can feel like uh, taking everything on your own shoulders, that you are, you're, 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 you're moving 
through this thing as the lone voice right now that people are listening to. And so you make a boss move like that. And do you feel that pressure of having to be right now uh, the Neo, the one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. I feel pressure. I don't feel pressure to be the one, but I just feel pressure because if I don't do well, then I'll be the last. Right. And that's the burden that black creators carry. Um, uh, yeah. Like, and I'll give you an example. Even though I wrote against him and I would write it again, Nate Parker. Yeah. Um, Nate Parker fucked up. Yep. He fucked up 19 years ago, and he fucked up when he handled this, because Oprah came to him and said, I will help you deal with this. And he said, Oprah, I don't need your help. And I'm just like, boy, what? <laughs> Nobody says no to Oprah. Like, has he not learned from Jonathan Franzen? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when Oprah calls and says, I will, Oprah Billionaire says, I will help you with risk management and salvage your movie. And you're like, nah, something's wrong with you. Um, but the problem is that now people are like going to be less willing to take a chance on That's a right. black filmmaker because of this one flawed person. And the film actually also ended up being flawed. Um, but that's OK. We have to be able to create flawed black art. We have to be able to be mediocre. And we will have achieved success when we will be able to be mediocre in the same way that white people are allowed to be mediocre. So you can go now. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It it's is true. absolutely true. And so I feel a lot of pressure because I think if I fuck this up, then no other black woman is going to have this opportunity. And that, that would be a crime and a shame, but it is the reality. And so that's why, that's one of the many reasons I work so hard. Um, so it is a lot of pressure. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it would be. Um, you, uh, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're on Twitter now. All right. <laughs> because uh, speaking of black film. This little table um, is so I, far away. I know, it's so far. <laughs> I can't even move it. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's my best. You didn't put it there. I know, but I, and, still. And whoever put it there is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that. There are many hands that go into making an evening like this For possible, sure. including the great sound lady. Yes, she's great. She's making us sound so great. Um, we're talking about, uh, about black film. And I got to say that my relationship with you on Twitter is just like when I was watching Get Out. I was like, girl, don't go. Don't. <laughs> Why are you going down there? <laughs> don't go there. I, that's what I feel. I feel this trepidation for you on that medium. But something is feeding you through that medium. Because that's the only reason that I could see anyone being as engaged in Twitter as you are. Oh, you know, it's funny that people feel that way, that I'm like that engaged. Twitter takes up like 10 minutes of my day. It's not that deep for me. Uh, I'm just like, it's social media. I'm just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Someone's coming over to talk to me. Let me look at my phone. Um, and <laughs> that's really kind of it. Um, I'm the queen of just like. <laughs> I was in the airport in Chicago, and this woman made eye contact. And I was like, fuck, she knows who I am. <laughs> and I was fine with that, but I was just so tired. I haven't been sleeping. I've been traveling into a, like, a different city every day. I just couldn't do it. And I, but I didn't want to be rude. And so I was just like, if I'm deeply engaged right. with my phone, it'll be all right. right. But I enjoy Twitter because um, for the past 12 years, I've lived in very rural places. Uh, and it's getting slightly better with each move, but uh, Twitter f at first allowed me to connect with other writers and just people who might be similar mm -hmm. in interests and, and to connect with writers I loved. And then in my head, in many ways, I'm still someone with 200 followers and a locked account. <laughs> and You're so I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm having a hard time adjusting yeah. to the, this new reality uh, where. I tweet something and it becomes a news story. I mean, like on the Daily Dot, but nonetheless. It's still a news story. A news I mean, story. that still counts. It's weird. I mean, which is even how the Milo thing broke out. I was talking to my friend who works at BuzzFeed, but I was talking to him as a friend. And um, 
he was like, yeah, I, I'm not pulling my book or something like that. Or no, Simon & Schuster's uh, CEO had sent out a letter. And I said, yeah, I read the letter. I'm still pulling my book. And that's it. And that's how it became a story. And I never once in my life dreamed that it was going to become a story. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to, the transition between just being me and then being me is, yeah. is, is difficult. But Twitter is a relaxing thing 80% of the time. Right. And it's a cesspool of misery <laughs> for the other 20% of the time. But is that 20% worth it? Like, do, do you feel like it's, it's... It used to be. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it is anymore. I always said I would never leave Twitter, but it's getting so unpleasant. Like, and it's not even the trolls. I expect the trolls to troll. And Twitter is quietly behind the scenes getting much better about banning accounts, especially if you have um, a significant following. And it's not fair. They should be doing it for everyone. But we'll, you know, I think it's the step in the right direction. And so when I report an account these days, it's generally banned within an hour. And that's really nice. You know, it, what's even harder on Twitter is that people are always correcting me. <laughs> always. Like today, I t like last night I tweeted a picture. I went to the hotel at, after my event last night in Chicago, and they had made a book, a chocolate book of difficult women. Yeah, it was so cute. <laughs> And I saw it on Twitter. It was this so touching. I, I was like so moved. I started crying because <laughs> a I was exhausted, but I was literally that moved. And I just thought, oh my god, it's the most dreamy thing. Like all well, my dreams have come true now. <laughs> I, I I retire. And um, and so I tweeted an emoji of a face with a tear. And today a guy said, actually. You just used the Japanese emoji for sleep. Motherfucker, what? <laughs> like, come on. And he was like dead ass serious. And so I tweeted him back and I said, Eli, do better. <laughs> just, his name is Eli. <laughs> and do better. And it's just that kind of thing gets really aggravating. Like people correct me on every little thing. And oftentimes they're correcting things I already know. Mm -hmm. And it's just frustrating. I don't know, do I give off the impression of stupidity? Is it the PhD? <laughs> like, what about me? Like, what about me makes you think I'm dumb? <laughs> I watch Vanderpump Rules, but that's because I'm the smartest person here. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's hard to constantly have to defend yourself. And when people disagree with me, they tell me. Mm -hmm. And they're like, but I want dialogue. And the thing is, if I had 200 followers, yes, but I have 190,000. And so I can't dialogue with all of you. Yeah, of I really, really can't. And it just, I've gotten to the point where I've become very short on social media. And, and I don't like that because that's not who I am. And I'm actually very quiet and shy and... I'm a nice person in my day-to-day -day life, and I'm not being nice right now and on Twitter. And I, I don't like that because I don't want to change who I am um, because of something I don't get paid to do. And that's what I worry about. I mean, I think that's what the fear, the, the fear comes from, mm -hmm. is that it's not even so much what is being said, but the amount that, of engagement that it, even though you say it's 10 minutes, the emotional minutes that it takes up. Yeah, it does take emotional minutes. It does. And when it does, I walk away. And I'll take up to a week off. And I get emails like, when are you coming back? People email you and ask you when you're coming back to Twitter? Yeah, I did you. Wow. <laughs> Which is actually very touching. I, 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 um, I don't mind that at all. I, I generally answer honestly, uh, it's going to be a couple more days. And the other thing that's getting harder is that my dad follows me on Twitter. <laughs> Which I don't mind. There's nothing I would say on Twitter that, I mean, I wouldn't say it necessarily in the same room as him, but uh, I, I have nothing to hide from him at this point. I'm 42. It's, you know, like, this is who I am. You made me. Um, but when people are mean to me and say mean things, he gets really hurt and upset. And that bothers me because he's, you know, 70 and... These are his like happy golden years, and he shouldn't have to deal with that. And of course, he also tells my mom she she doesn't know how to get on Twitter, but he <laughs> is her Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, they're both there, and they take it really seriously. They also like read the comments. Oh. I know, I have told them. 
I was like, you want to see some very foul things about your child, don't read the comments. And so it, it's just getting out of hand. And when the Milo thing happened, like, his followers on Facebook and Twitter have been calling my parents' house. What? Because their number is listed, and mine is not. And it's just, that's too far. Like, when it starts to affect my family, who has not done anything, and who are, like, truly good people, um, it's just, ugh, it's hard. Well, we got to it. We got to Twitter. We did. We did. And um, the unfortunate part is that I have about six thousand more questions for you that I just want to ask, but do it. I'm just going to be, <laughs> I'm just going to be your pen pal and just going to ask, them, ask well, just, you yeah. that way. Oh, I just thought we'd stay here all night. We could, <laughs> we could, but I think the proper thing to do right now is that all of these people came from so far, um, as far as, I don't know, East Toronto, Lee side. <laughs> Um, Leslieville, <laughs> and some from Etobicoke, maybe. Um, so they should be able to ask you some questions. Absolutely. So, so they're hi there. like, hi. Uh, there are like 50 million questions I could ask, like uh, not on sheets of paper, but just in my brain. But one thing that was that struck me as I was reading the collection was the repetition of twins. There are so many stories with twins in them, and I just want to know why. Yeah. <laughs> I've been asked that question a lot, and I didn't realize it. I just did not realize it. It's because all the stories were written separately, but clearly, during those years, I was obsessed with twins. Um, I just I was really interested in the idea of having an identical physical copy of yourself out in the world, and what is that relationship like? And, and so it really intrigued me, and it clearly intrigued me two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, good evening, Roxanne. Um, it's a pleasure to hear you speak. I'm a Thank big you. fan, and I've read all sorts of your works. Ooh. Um, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask you about um, some of the other work that you've done, particularly on celebrity profiles. I'm not a big fan of those, but for some reason, and you're quite, <laughs> not saying not of your, I'm a fan of your celebrity profiles, is what I'm trying to say. I got you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, um, with Madonna's uh, Harper's Bazaar profile you did last fall, and the one of Charlie Hunnam that you just mm -hmm. did for InStyle, uh, how is it that you're able to elicit interesting responses from them that makes it kind of fresh and interesting and it's mm -hmm. not you know the kind of answers that are just regurgitated in every single profile yeah um thank you i when i was when i got the opportunity to do the madonna thing i was really surprised i had turned down a profile once before because of low self-esteem but it was for um lupita nyong'o oh, oh. i know i know <laughs> But I was just like, oh, she's so beautiful, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and then Madonna was gonna be featured in this 150th anniversary issue or whatever. It was a ridiculous number of anniversaries. And um, she requested me. And, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, well, you're gonna have to deal with your self-esteem right now because the material girl wants to meet you. And, and so I read a lot of interviews with her, and I had my, I have an assistant, and I, I need to use her more, but I had her pull, a, I was just like, find every interview Madonna has ever done. And when she gets a task like that, watch out, because she's gonna give you exactly what you ask for. Mm -hmm. And so I read as many as I could, and I noticed the similar questions, and I knew you, ha you have to ask some of the similar questions just to sort of refresh, but I just thought, what am I gonna ask her that people aren't asking her? And <clears throat> so I just did it that way. And with Charlie Hunnam, I knew that he did not wanna be asked about Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, which he had to back out of, which is a shame, because um, he would have been- He would have been way better. <laughs> right? Because of his jeans, right? He would have been, for, because Those of his jeans. everything. <laughs> oh. Who wears jeans like that? God is, God is real. <laughs> 
Look at God. I knew, I knew not to ask him about that, but here I had this pretty boy, and I was like, I'm not going to pretend that you are not extraordinarily attractive. And in person, he is extraordinarily attractive, and he has an English accent. And so I was just like, my vagina just fluttered. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to ask him, you know, we always ask women sort of like, what is it like being a sex object? And so I was like, I'm going to ask this dude. And he had a thoughtful answer to it. I think that celebrities have thoughtful answers nine times out of 10, but they're not asked thoughtful questions. And so I just ask the kinds of questions that I want to always see answered, but never do in celebrity profiles. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to get a little bit more serious, do you believe that Corinne will find love on Bachelor mm -hmm. in Paradise? <laughs> And more importantly, do you believe that it will be Chad? Oh, great question. I don't believe Corinne will find love with anyone but herself. Um, she's, oh, but if she does, it's got to be with Chad. She and Chad are, like, made for each other. Oh, Chad is so horrible. <laughs> I, is Corinne going to be on Bachelor Paradise? I, I don't think the franchise would ever be trusted again if they don't. If make they, that I, happen. Mean, I mean, you know who else is going? Uh, Raven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo, Raven! <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be good, but I bet you Nick is going to show up too because there's no way he and Vanessa are really together. Did you guys, I mean, I'm sorry for everyone here who doesn't watch The Bachelor. But I'm, I'm sorry for them too. <laughs> yeah. Nick and Vanessa clearly are no longer together. They kept talking, they were like, they're like four weeks into their relationship and they're like, it's been a lot of work, it's been horrible. <laughs> and I was like, they made it seem like love is a coal mine. And I, I was just, yeah, it's just not good. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would ask is, is just maybe to talk for a minute about if, whether or not you're excited for Rachel's season or, or what, that, what that means yes. to you. Yes. <laughs> I am very excited for Rachel's season. Uh, I think it's incredibly important for a black woman to be considered a romantic Absolutely. object, even yeah. though objectification is not good. Um, the, the thing is, all too often, black women are seen as maternal in caretakers. And we even saw that with the Grammy Awards this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. when Adele got on stage oh. and she was like, oh, Beyonce, I want you to be my mommy. Mm -hmm. Now, Beyonce is pregnant, to be fair, but she wore a sheer dress mm -hmm. on stage. And when I look at Beyonce, I don't think mommy maternally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. I am, like, in love with Beyonce. <laughs> And then Faith Hill had the audacity. Yeah. Faith Hill could be Beyonce's mom and was like, you're my mommy too. And I was like, this is how they see the most beautiful woman in the world. Like God and the president all wrapped in one. Yeah. And it, it's just audacious. And so I think this is a step in the right direction um, for a, a beautiful, successful black woman to be seen as somebody who is worthy of 25 uh, pharmaceutical salesman. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid for her as well, though. I, I have fear for her. You I know, do. I have some fear for her. In what way? I have fear for her in that I don't want her to be manipulated. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, I just feel uh, like, I always lawyer. feel like, you know, someone's going to set... Yeah. You know, I, I understand that fear, but I think she has a good head on her shoulders. I think her family seems good in terms of the, what we saw on the show. Um, so obviously we know everything there is to know. Uh, I think it's going to be okay, but I think what I fear for her is that ABC is going to shit the bed. Yes. Because they've already started by bringing those five guys or however many guys. It was yes. so sloppy. Yeah. My brother texted me. I've gotten my brother and his wife into the show as well. And my brother texted me and said, what is happening? I can't watch. Oh my God, he's rapping. And it was so uncomfortable and it was unnecessary. Like, oh, we're starting Your Bachelor now. They're not even done casting the season. Mm -hmm. Something happened, mm -hmm. clearly, for why they are released that she's the Bachelorette this early. Something happened. I suspect that someone 
had found out what was happening and they were going to blackmail them to go to the press and they decided they were going to get out ahead of the story. But it, it's, I'm worried about ABC. That's, that's the worry. Yeah. Hi. Hi, so I'm, I'm a little flustered. I'm, I'm still halfway through Caitlin's season and I'm just really trying to like <laughs> encounter too many spoilers. Um, so I, I don't follow you on Twitter. I quit Twitter last year because of just the unpleasantness, um, but I do follow you on Goodreads. Yeah. And I love you on Goodreads. Um, you mentioned kind of a, a fear or a trepidation about being kind of the first or possibly last in a line of like, yeah, black fem feminist writers. Um, are there any young writers who you see following in your path or, or following in a, like a parallel path who you would like to tell us to read? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Morgan Jerkins, Ashley Ford, um, Morgan Parker. Uh, I'm terrible with names. I am, that's, I'm terrible with names. Um, she's not up and coming, but, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting her name. Aisha, uh, I'm going to forget her last name. Anyway, yes, there are plenty of black women that are, Aisha Siddiqui, oh. thank you. Uh, she's not up and coming though. Uh, she's well established, but there are plenty of black women that are coming up and are also already established doing some amazing work right now. Seek them out. Yes. Yes. Hi, sorry, I have two questions. The first one's very quick. Um, where did you get that shirt? Because I'm a fat woman with big boobs and I would always like to know where to get clothes. <laughs> this is a custom made shirt. Oh. <laughs> yep, well, I, I love Ina Garten. And Ina, <coughs> she's perfect. And she wears the same shirt every day, but in different colors. Mm. And so I went to her website, and one of the questions on her FAQ was, where did you get your shirt? <laughs> and she said, I'm not going to tell you, but I got it custom made. And so I was like, hmm. And so I went to a tailor in the city where my parents live, and I said, I need shirts that I can do events in that will accommodate my size and my breasts. And he made me shirts. Mm. And they're beautiful shirts. That's a Thank beautiful you. shirt. Thank you. And the second question is, really quickly, um, you talked about competition and you talked about, um, sorry, I just had a mind blank. But I guess my question is, um, do you think that there's a way for women to be competitive with each other or to um, sort of call out people's you know, um, lack of risk guard for intersections without it being, I guess, or t characterized as, or turning into something that sort of shut each other down. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I ask that because I feel like that <coughs> men are often allowed to be competitive with each other and to seem ambitious without it being like a man thing. And so I was wondering, you know, and for me it's very important to be able to sort of hear yeah. from, have people call me out and to be able to remind other people when they're not sort of yeah. Um, yeah. considering yeah. that. And so I was wondering if there's a, do you see a positive, supportive way to do that? Yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, when I say, I mean, when we say, you know, women's relationships aren't competitive or so on, there's nothing wrong with competition. I'm a very competitive person, I assure you. There are writers that I feel very competitive with, and when they achieve a milestone, I am like, God damn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do I one up this? <laughs> Um, and I also think that we can criticize each other. Um, it's a question of how. It's just being good about criticizing each other and making sure that you're criticizing the work and not tearing people down. I think you just have to learn how to be con criti ugh. constructive criticism, I think, is the way to go. I, I think that all too often it just becomes a call-out situation where we pillory someone for having an opinion. Like for example, Chimamanda and Gose Adichie. Yes. She put her foot in it. She did. She did. She stepped in a big old pile of mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. I was just like, girl, like, mm -hmm. shh. <laughs> and then she doubled down. I know, I know. With her statement, I was like, stop no, talking, no. girl. Stop. But I think that we can't, and not even, I think that trans women, first and foremost, should be responding. But the rest of us can also respond to have their backs mm -hmm. and just say, women are women are women. And um, 
I think there's a way to do that without saying that her body of work should be dismissed, which Absolutely. is what I've seen. And I'm like, y'all are quick to throw your faves under the bus mm -hmm. when they are human, and she was human. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that when we are human and when we fail, it comes at such a high price for marginalized people. Absolutely. But that is just the reality. And so I think that there are ways to engage with that or other ways in which we fail um, without dismissing everything. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. The intersectionality of being black and female brings its own unique challenges. And what are the top three pieces of advice you'd give to a black female writer who's trying to navigate a mostly white editorial staff and space? Yes, um, you have to be willing to be edited and work with these white editors. Um, and what I mean by that is don't necessarily believe that they are not going to be able to edit you or work with you simply because they're white, while also being wary just in case they step out of line and you need to correct and get them back in formation. Um, <laughs> it happens. I think that you have to know when to stand your ground because sometimes this industry which is so dominated by whiteness, they just don't know. They don't understand cultural nuance, mm -hmm. and you have to know when to stand your ground and know I'm doing the right thing, and I know my voice and what my work needs, and you have to be willing and unafraid to do so. Oftentimes, it's gonna work out in your favor. And, um, but was it always like that for, for you though? Because it's, yes. for you to say that, I'm, I'm like, you're Roxanne Gay. No, that's very new. <laughs> that's very new. Um, it's all, I've always been that way. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, early in my career, again, I had a day job. Right. And so it was easy to stand my ground. Like, I don't need you. I will go back to work and make my little $10 an hour and be sure. fine. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, you have to stand your ground sometimes. But you, you have to also decide when it's worth your standing your ground and when it's worth giving in. And also find a mentor and find a black woman who will mentor you but also be open to mentors beyond that demographic. But it always helps to have a, a mentor that knows something of what you know in terms of what it means to move through the world. All right, so to quote Beyonce, keep slaying. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Fellow Vanderpump Rules fan. Uh, do you like um, Beverly Hills Housewives as well? Oh, <laughs> come on. Okay, it's so good. quick question, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you see what happened in China? Can we, can we, can we talk though? Um, okay, but really, okay. How do you feel about Erica? I love Erica Jane. How do I you feel about Erica great. and Lisa? I'm sorry. Oh, Lisa, I think is great. But do you think Erica's coming for Lisa's crown? No, she can't. Lisa's, but, no. She can. No, Lisa has two shows on Bravo. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a third. Though I suspect Erica's gonna get a spinoff. But I think Lisa is gonna get a third show about her puppies. Yes, okay, of sorry. course she is. Sorry, sorry guys. But I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This um, shit matters. <laughs> it does. Oh, can we also talk about Dorit? <laughs> no, 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 let's talk about Eden, because what is wrong with that woman? Eden has major problems. She's just, I just wanna- I'm just gonna I, get some water. You, do you? <laughs> I, want, I wanna hug her, but then she would keep it for too long. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> sorry, my mother wants me to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great segue. <laughs> Get her in line. I, I see you. What black literature inspired you as a young person? That's a great question, and I have a sad answer. I grew up in Nebraska, and I grew up with Haitian parents who were not familiar with black American literature. So I don't think I read black American literature until I was in high school. Hmm. Yeah, I know. When I did, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when I did, uh, Alice Walker, yeah. um, okay. The Color Purple, and the Possessing the Secret of Joy. Oh. Yes. Possessing the Secret of Joy to this day is one of my favorite novels. Yep. It is beautiful and heartbreaking and just, it is a perfect work of political writing that is fiction and that functions as fiction while making a very incredible statement about female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say enough about that novel. And then um, Beloved by mm -hmm. Toni Morrison. Of course. of course, yeah, really. If, yeah. But 
uh, when I did get to black literature, I got to the goods very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then um, Go Tell It on a Mountain, James Baldwin. Yeah. Okay. Did, you, did you get any Zora Neale Hurston in there? Yes, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Of course, yeah. Uh, Zami. Yep. Yep. Of course. I read a lot of Audre Lorde. Once I, once I figured it out, I had a great teacher in high school named Dolores Kendrick. It was the first black teacher I ever had in my whole life. And she was a poet and is a poet. And she taught us everything. And it was just glorious to realize that there were people who looked like me, who wrote stories about people who looked like me. It was, it was a miracle. It was a thing I did not know possible. The only black character I can ever remember reading was this girl um, named, I think her name was Nora in the Sweet Valley High books. Mm -hmm. And she, yeah. Yeah, she and, I read those books. She and Stephen Wakefield dated for one issue. Yes, yes, and then, and then she was gone, and yep, then she disappeared. They decided that too many people were struggling with their interracial mm -hmm. relationship, and so they broke up. I remember her. Stephen Wakefield, I don't want to spoil it. Do you guys know what happened with Stephen? <laughs> because I read the adult versions now. <laughs> Stephen has a boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> so that's the real reason he and Nora broke up. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. As an extension of that question, we, we've, we've mentioned Haiti mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I, and I wonder about the cultural traditions of Haiti, because there's a wonderful tradition of you know, great writers that come out of Haiti. And, yes. Um, do, you, do you dip into that world? And when can we expect you to write? more about Haiti. It feels like it's always there, but... It's always there. Yeah, um, I do, I don't read enough Haitian literature, but I've read some, Danny Laferriere, mm -hmm. um, and of course, Edwidge. Edwidge, yeah. I mean, the Haitian writer. Yeah. Uh, and, and rightly so. Uh, Who, by the way, is the kindest person I think I've ever met in my life. You know, sometimes you wonder, are they really as interesting or wonderful as they seem? And she is the one writer I have met who is as wonderful as they, she seems. One day, she and my parents were at an event, and when she found out my parents were there, she went and sat with them. Oh, my God, it brings tears to my eyes. And just, like, was hanging out with them. It was just so kind, and it was really appreciated. Um, so I read a lot of her, and she actually was my motivation mm -hmm. to believe I could do this right. and that I could write about Haiti. And um, growing up, Haiti mattered a lot. My parents made us read a lot of Haitian history books more than literature. Mm. And so we read this eight volume history of Haiti <laughs> in French. They don't mess around. No, they don't mess around. And I still have, the, I still have it, yeah. <laughs> yes. And so that's the kind of thing. And they also exposed us a lot to Haitian art, mm -hmm. visual art, my mom loves art. And so we um, would go to Haiti in the summers, and my great aunt owned an art gallery. And so we would meet all these great Haitian artists uh, and who worked across a, a range of mediums, or media, sorry. And that was really cool. So that was a lot of my exposure yeah. to Haitian culture. You're, you, are, uh, you are very Haitian to me. Fiery. Yes, I know? am. You've I'm very all, much a product yes, of my people. Very much so. And proudly very so. Much so. And you should be pr uh, proudly so. Thank Absolutely. you. Um, hi. Hello. Um, OK, so recently we've seen a lot of fashion brands put feminist slogans on their t-shirts. Dior's mm -hmm. We Should All Be Feminist t-shirts come to mind. Um, and that was followed by a, a backlash about using feminism to sell t-shirts. So I'm curious about what your thoughts are on that. Oh, fuck. I mean, <laughs> sorry, I curse too. I know I curse too much. It's, it's okay. a, I know. It's a, it's a sign of a, of a higher intellect is what they're saying. I, I agree. <laughs> and I was like, fuck that. Yeah. Exactly. I was like, I'm yeah. on such another level fucker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't care. I just don't care. Um, I think that there are bigger battles. I t people put all kinds of shit on t-shirts to make money. Why do we all of a sudden have a problem when it's feminism? Like that we're getting the word out about feminism. Feminism is like the only cultural movement that is constantly self-critiquing without doing much else. And then it's like, oh no, we don't want better PR. <laughs> You know, it's, that's just absurd to me. Now, I do think there are some really important capitalist critiques 
to be made about selling feminism and feminism as a brand. But that's only if that's the extent of your feminism. And I am more of a centrist than a radical when it comes to capitalism in that I feel like to dismantle capitalism before everyone has a, had a chance to enjoy it is, is the height of privilege. Um, you know, really, I, I'm from Haiti, so y'all, we haven't caught up. We're still mm -hmm. waiting for a sewage system yeah. in 2017. We do not have a sewage system, okay? That's where Haiti is at. And so, yes, let's dismantle capitalism, but can we get some of it first? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I just think there are bigger battles. Hi. Um, so in conversations with a lot of my female friends who are starting in the workforce after going to university or doing whatever, um, especially a lot of us are you know, finding success and doing really well, um, but are still having trouble believing it for ourselves and really feeling worthy. And I feel like imposter syndrome is really prevalent. Um, so I wondered if you had any advice or maybe a mantra for, for people like me who are feeling that way. For imposter syndrome? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, because I'm still looking for that too. I feel imposter syndrome all the time. It's hard, but I do think that it's okay to feel like an imposter, as long as you also have a gut belief that you deserve to be in a given room. Yeah. You have to have that gut belief, and no one's going to give it to you. You can't buy it. You can't find it. You have to, you have to dig it out of yourself. And there are always going to be all kinds of messages and people who are trying to tell you, no, you don't belong, and you have to resist that. Um, but if you're already in the room, of course you belong there. And it's just really important to remember that. I remind myself of that every day. Like when I do an event like this, I, I think, who the hell am I? But then I think, yeah, you know what? 900 people bought my book and showed up. Yep. OK. I had a, uh, a mentor who is a, she's a human rights lawyer, and then she turned to, uh, she was a senior producer at the CBC, and she climbed up the ranks, and I walked into her office, she's my first boss, and I walked into her office, and I was like, people think I can do stuff, <laughs> and I can't do any of this. I'm, this is a game, I'm playing a game, this is not real. And she said, the minute that you stop feeling that, you gotta check what you're doing. Mm -hmm and rethink it mm -hmm. because you always have to feel like you're on, on the back of your, that's what's gonna propel you forward. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about sometimes uh, being okay with a little hater, you know, and just making peace with it as it sits on you. Absolutely, on your absolutely. Shoulder. I think it also keeps you ambitious yes. and, and striving and for more. And being better. Yes, because for me, when I first really started feeling imposter syndrome was when I started teaching. Because when you start teaching as a graduate student in most graduate programs, they just throw you in the classroom on your first day of grad school. Like, they just, I'm just like, they're letting me teach? What the fuck? <laughs> me? <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> and, and so you have to start to hype yourself up. Like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I am going to grade you. <laughs> <laughs> and. But that, that doubt and that worry is what kept me doing my lesson plans and trying to be better from one day to the next to make sure that my students were having a reasonably useful time and actually a good time. I want my students to, I'm not an entertainer in the classroom, but I want them to be happy to come to class. I want them to learn something in a way that's valuable. So yeah. Yes. We've got time for two more, I'm sorry. You know what, we'll take everyone that's standing up, but yes. nobody else can get in line. How about that? I like that. I like yeah. the way you work. Oh, yeah, we're getting gangsta. Sorry, <laughs> library. I feel very LL Cool J all of a sudden up here with you. I'm going to knock you out. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned uh, turning down doing a profile of Lupita because of feeling low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And I know as women and as people, we have good days and bad days. What do you do when you're sad? Oh, Christ. <laughs> I cry. <laughs> you know, when I'm sad, I oftentimes just sit in my apartment in a very oversized t-shirt and boxer shorts, and I lie on my couch under a very soft blanket, and I watch marathons of bad television. 
I really do. That's how I reset. Oh, and I play games on my phone. Mm -hmm. And I just like, don't talk to me. <laughs> Tetris. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I know you, you're doing World of Wakanda. And um, with the cinematic universe of Marvel now going into, say, um, Black Panther, do you have a say creatively in what those warrior women that are portrayed in the world of Wakanda coming over to the cinematic universe, considering that Marvel has had some issues with representation mm -hmm. of minorities and um, people on screen? Yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. uh, Marvel is a very big corporation. The comic division and the movie division are very separate. They're not even in the same city, really. Um, and at Marvel, the writers are a cog in the machine, like seriously the lowest on the totem pole. Yeah. And I don't mean that negatively. I have had a wonderful experience with Marvel, but yeah, I have no power whatsoever. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about writing. Um, yes. I'm going to make this brief. So I'm writing uh, my dissertation right now, and um, I write about violence against black women. Um, and, you know, the theoretical stuff, well, that's a mess, but I don't care about that. Um, I'll, what I'm working on is doing, like, vignettes, so doing some um, fiction, trying my hand at it. Um, and it's just really overwhelming sometimes because there's representation issues. I want to get this right. But I also, you know, want to write about black women's experiences, their stories, their relationships with one another. Um, but particularly in writing about violence, um, you know, reading your work has really helped me. And I'm just wondering how you approach writing about violence that oftentimes would be unspeakable for, you know, just, just talking about survivor stories, if mm -hmm. you have any thoughts on that. Yes, that's an excellent question. When I'm writing about violence, I, I'm always doing it very carefully. That is not something I ever take lightly. Mm -hmm. And so for a given story, I always just think, what does this story need? And how can I be as true as possible to the experience of violence? And sometimes that means being explicit, and sometimes it means not. Uh, and again, it's just a story dictates for me. I always make sure that I'm not, <clears throat> not co-opting someone else's story. That's really important to me. So when I wrote my novel in Untamed State, for example, a lot of people were like, did you do a lot of research? And I was like, no, I made it all up. And I meant that because I didn't want to read a bunch of news articles about women who had been kidnapped in Haiti and steal their stories. Uh, that was so important to me because I think that if they want their stories told, they will tell them. And so that's very important. I also am always thinking about the line between explicit and gratuitous. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I, it's, it's a negotiation. And so you also want to think about that. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with being explicit about violence, because violence is very physical, it's very emotional, it's visceral, and sometimes being explicit on the page is the only way that you can try and ethically and accurately approximate the experience, and that's okay. Uh, and also, you just have to have boundaries for yourself in terms of just knowing when you need to step away so that you don't become so immersed in the violence that you start, it starts to take a toll on your emotional health. And so you always want to find ways to come up for air from the work. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Thanks Hi. for taking the last mm -hmm. question. Absolutely. Um, so my question is about maybe earlier on in your career and, okay, let me articulate. So I'm a, a documentary filmmaker and a writer. Uh, I used to be an organizer, and in the moment that I was making the switch, people started telling me that there wasn't value in art in the moment, because mm -hmm. we need people on the ground right now. So my question is, do you ever have that urge to sort of, because writing and filmmaking, it's a process. Sometimes it takes years for that impact to be felt. How do you just get in the room and, and write and shut off sort of what's happening right now, you know? I, I'm not shutting off what's happening right now. Yeah. It's informing my work. Mm -hmm. um, my work is me being on the ground, no matter how long it takes. And so if you're making a documentary, documentaries take a long time, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work, but you're not ignoring the world. Mm -hmm. You are telling a story. And so I don't think you have to shut out the world. I think what you have to do is believe in what you're doing yeah. and stop letting people get in your head about the value of your work. 
Thank you. You're welcome. We have one more round of applause for Roxanne Gay, Garvia Bailey. Oh, Toronto. Can we have a round of applause for this lovely woman? Get out of here. Thank you. Oh, you're so Thank welcome. you so, Thank so you. much. Thank you.